pro, where were you living at that time? I was I was in uh, in, in, in the North Carolina area, uh, okay. Mooresville, uh, Troutman, North Carolina area. Yeah, and you married? Uh, yeah, yeah. And you married with a race habit, which uh, is an exceptional. Well, that the, the great thing about yeah. it is my 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 beautiful wife Kelly. She she's uh, um, she's got this stuff as as bad as I do, probably worse. She actually wrote the biography that's out right now about Warren Johnson. So she, she's a published author, you know, and she, uh, she, she's the rock star, you know. So I didn't know that this is, and I don't think a lot of people know this about you. That helps having the support on the home front. Cause yeah. we see it all the time. The car guys that have that car habit and then the wife that doesn't like, it. we call it the wife acceptance factor. <laughs> you got the wife participation factor. I tell you, I, I, I met, collaboration. Yeah. Just for a quick sidebar. I, that's how I met my wife. We, uh, we had set the national record for ET in Pomona, California one year. And uh, just by happenstance, she was following, because uh, she worked for National Dragster, she was following NHRA tech around. And so I'm tearing the engine apart, and so we can, we can, we can get everything certified and, and get it, make sure we're legal. And she was with the, with the tech people, right? And she's in there, and I'm, I'm pulling the engine apart, and I pull a head gasket up. She's like, that's a head gasket. And I'm like, you're right. And then... then <laughs> Now we, we've been we've been married. I love you. Know, you. Yeah, I, I love you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, so, so we so we, now we've we've been married uh, this, this December. We can. Hey guys, Dave Smith. This is the Factory Five Solid Car Guys podcast, and today is a really fun day. We've got Pat Toplinski here from Engine Power. Pat, we go way back, man. Welcome. Yeah, man. It's, it's always fun to be here, and uh, yeah, we do go way back. It's kind of a neat deal, isn't it? Yeah, we started with RTM, kind of learning, you know, broadcast, and and you kind of have been with us through a lot of different episodes. And you know, people don't have um, kind of a front row seat to your background. And and I was looking at what you've done before Engine Power and before you know broadcast and all your you know fame. Um, <laughs> Did some pretty interesting things, but I looked just in my notes. Um, we started in 2010-11. We did a GTM with an LS3. When did you start with RTM? I started with RTM in 2014. Right. So before you, we did it with, and that was with Courtney Hansen. Yeah. You know, um, we did an LS3, uh, the E-Rod swapped into a GTM, but mm -hmm. we started with you. I think it was on the hot rod, mm -hmm. but we did the 427. What was uh, Rick Bacon, yeah. uh, the arsonist, Rick, and uh, Tommy Bozier, yep. right? Yep. Um, that was about 2013, 14. I think we did our Mark four. Yep. You know, but step me back. If you give these guys your background from when you were young, your first cars, what got you into the car business? And, you know, it's, it's a tough way to make a living, but it's also really fun. So, you know, what's your backstory? Cause I pick you up really with broadcast. Yeah. It, it's, it's funny because if you were to tell me that I was going to do this for a living, I would have thought you were insane, right? I've been a car guy my my whole life, right? So when you uh when you're a car guy, you always have some origin story. What what's the thing that clicked, right? And this was way back um I was probably seven or eight years old. My cousin Mark had a 55 Chevy. And uh it was, this was a blue 55 Chevy that he had bought in Wait, now you grew up in Michigan. I grew up in northern Michigan. I, right, okay. I, I come from a town called Boyne Falls, Michigan. 300 people, right? And uh, it's it's in the northern lower peninsula, and, and there, there's hot rod stuff up there. But my, my cousin he had this really cool car, and and, and he, had, he has he had a buddy that had a, a DZ Camaro, and he had this '55 Chevy. And uh, back in the day when you could still buy Sunoco high test gasoline out of the pump, he came over and picked my sister and I up, and we rode in this car. This is a uh, 427 dual quad uh, Muncie transmission in it, um, and some sprints on it, and we ran over. And uh, this was the coolest, loudest. Thing I'd ever. Now, how, how old were you? Seven or eight years old. Right on. Okay. And uh, and uh, I said, man, uh, I know what I want to do for a living. I want I want to work on cars. I want to build engines, right? And it's always been the engines for me. I, even even from very very small, I, I like working on stuff. But the engines were always the were always the uh, thing that I that I gravitated towards. What was your first car when you got your license or before? A 1973 Mercury Comet. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. And this thing had uh, being in Michigan, you know, it's 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 complete rust bucket. Yep. I was gonna um, say the fifty five was probably rusted out too. I that mean, was an actually a really, really, really nice car. And really he, he still has that car to, to this no day. No way. And uh but the, my 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 first car was a mustard yellow comet, right? Had power kings on the back, had dirt tires on it. It was it was a it was a train wreck, right? Yep. But that that was my first car and, and uh we, we just we went from there and my buddies I had a few buddies that were car guys and uh, we just worked on the stuff. I ended up having a uh my my car that I that I that I really got into doing a lot of stuff with with you know ru running on a track and stuff like that. I had an eighty two Fairmont. I built mm -hmm. a Fairmont. You were running circle track with no, that? No, it was, it was drag stuff. Oh, okay, you know? drag and, racing. Uh, yeah. It was a street yeah. car drag. You were kind of drag racing, kind of droid. That was where you kind of that was where you cut your teeth, right? Yeah, drag racing was it. You know, drag racing was a, was a 
Uh, to me, it was just more appealing. I, I the, the circle track, we had a local little circle track, but I, I always thought it was disheartening. You work on your stuff all week and you go out there and wreck it, you know? So it, I think that if you're wrecking stuff and drag it, it's, it's a little bit different situation there. So, and, But there is some romance in small town Michigan and it's the same way in, in, in the Midwest all over and down South. If you're in a small town, you're not 20, 30 miles from a circle track. And in Montague, Michigan, mm-hmm. it was Whiskey Ridge back oh. then. I don't even know if it's in business anymore. Wow. But back where you were, there was a circle track local. But you went drag racing. Um, school, how did you get into really, I mean, I don't know if it was Funny Car or Top Fuel. What were you working on it's, in it's, terms it's of? Pro Stock. Pro Stock, right. Yeah. So yeah. that's where, yeah. Yeah. Like, um, how the, how'd you get from high school? And and to pro stock, I mean, it's a hell of a jump. It it, it is. And when I when I got out of high school, first thing I was going to go to college, right? And there's a great college in, in in Michigan for automotive at Ferris State University, and I was really looking at going there. And I, I got a uh, um, an opportunity to work at a local auto parts store, which had a machine shop. Wait, did you go to Ferris State? No, I, I okay. did not. I, I I that was one of those things where I, it, it, that was kind of the that was kind of the goal. And I, when I got out of school, this was in I, I graduated in 1988. Yep. Right. So uh, back, back then, um, we I really let's say, I loved working on stuff and I had an opportunity to work at a local auto parts store and I was the head garbage can emptier and toilet polisher. And I got in there and I was a delivery boy and uh, there was an opening in the machine shop because the guy was, was going out and I got in. And so one thing led to another. I was the manager of the machine shop at age 19. You know, and it was you taught by doing just that's I, how you no, I, Yeah, it was really wasn't I, we, we was on the job training, but, you know, bore. Hone, you know, uh, surfacing, small block Chevy, yeah, 350s. everything. And well, the ma- majority of it was uh, dealership work from the local area, okay. yeah. and also uh, it's all farm implements. Yeah, we worked on everything from two and a half, to, you, know, you know, horsepower Tecumsehs to Detroit's and everything in between. Well, I, that's funny because you mentioned Fair State. My cousin went there, and that mm-hmm. was kind of heavy equipment, engine centric. Yeah. It was really one of the best in the at, at the time in that whole area. Yeah, um, but you learned by doing, and then how do you get from that? to pro stock. Ah, it, well, so, so I worked at, at the machine shop for, and I worked in, in uh, you know, up through the nineties. And then, uh, in 1997, I saw a little tiny ad in the back of hot rod magazine uh, for a uh, be a, uh, an engine builder, professional engine builder. And it was from Sam you know, school of automotive machinists. They had these little tiny ads back then. And so, uh, I, I got some information, went down there and toured it. And, uh, I enrolled in that place. And, uh, I, I started there in, in June of 98. Eight. And then um, I, I came in as a student. I had a lot of experience. Right? I'd already been building engines right, for, right. For, for a while. Um, there's some obviously things I didn't know. I'd never dynoed anything before. You know, I'd never balanced any cranks before. So there's some stuff that were, was very important to learn. Um, but by January of 99, I became the general manager and chief machining instructor there. And I worked from Sam Tech all the way up till 2006, where I got another opportunity just by happenstance of learning about, you know, that going going to a like a real national. I'd never been to a national event like for drag racing, NHRA. Yeah, right. And we 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 so the, back then Houston used to have two events. They had a spring and a fall, and I I was I went to the fall one because I'd gotten there in June. Um, so I went to this fall event, and I said, man, I'm just going to take some resumes with me and and, and pass them out. So. I literally had a uh, you know button up shirt, khaki pants, carrying a briefcase around. It's kind of an odd thing to see it on yeah, the right. track. And I passed a few uh, passed a few uh, resumes out. And the one that I got a call from the next Tuesday was Warren Johnson. And uh, so he uh, he looked at my resume and we uh, talked a little bit. He says I'd like you to come to to uh, Sugar Hill, sit down with me for a while. So I I did. And I, again, keep in mind, I was I was at the school instructing as well. Right. So I, I get there, and uh, first thing I do, I sit down in his office. He first thing right off the bat, he says, "I'd like to know if you want to come to work for me." And I'm like, "I'm, you know, I'm like, wow, that's 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 amazing." These are people. That's the first interview question. You want to come to work? Yeah. Wow. And, and these, these are these people. You must I used, liked your resume. Yeah, this is people like I, I used to watch growing up. You know, like like you know Warren and, and Bob Glidden and, and and guys like that. Just those were the. The guys used to watch on TV in Michigan. You didn't get you know drag racing on TV that much, but then you see these guys like these. These are these are your guys you you you, you look up to, right? Because they're engine builders, they're racers. But uh, um, so I, I explained to him. I said, you know, I gotta go back and I gotta, I gotta think about this. I, I'm I'm enrolled in school. I'm I'm an instructor, but I'm still enrolled in school. And I go back and 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 talk to the, the owner of the school, Judd Judd Massigo, and he said, I said, man, I have a job offer for more. And he's like, I don't blame you if you take it. He says, but I want you to stay here. And he said, we're going to start a race program. I said, he said, we don't have any race cars. I want you to start the, the race program and we're going to run some cars and you're going to get to build a car. For- was he running pro stock at the time? No, no. Uh, um, uh, the school wasn't. The school, yeah. we, we were running uh, uh, NMCA and NMRA. No, no, stuff. Your, your interview. 
Yeah. 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 Well, Warren, yeah. Warren, he was, uh, he was, he was the, uh, I mean, he was for that year, he was the champion for that year. And so, uh, and so I, I actually went back and said to uh, Judd, I said, yeah, I got this job offer. And he said, well, I want you to do this. I want you to, to uh, build uh, a race program here. I want you to build a car and you get to drive it. I'm like, oh, no. Now, have you been drag racing your own cars before? Yeah, yeah. You had it, some good experience very, kind of. Very sporadically because, yeah. you know, the closest drag strip is hours away yeah. in, in, in Michigan, right? So it, Maybe it was, at the time, if you remember, what was the <clears> best time you'd run? Oh, I, I, this was my street car. I, let's say this, this. I had this 82 Fairmont with a Windsor in it, right? Yeah. And I drove it open headers and, and slicks on, on the street. Uh, had a trans brake on it. I love it, Michigan, man. Yeah. I just love it. This it's car, a different we, world. We would go out and this car, it, this was an 1180 car. It, it car would run 1180 at, at 112. Which was fast, yeah. Was, yeah. Back in 1989, yeah. that, that's fast, right? Now now pickups go that fast. Right. But, uh, but uh, so that's how that, went. so I, I went back and I said, man, I got a horribly tough decision. The toughest thing I've ever had to tell somebody is tell Warren Johnson that, uh, thanks, but I'm going to stay here at the school. And he was, was super cool about it. He says, I understand. I understand that education is important. Let's just keep in touch. And I've been friends with him, you know, ever since. So well, yeah. you've built a good career on that. And, and your path yeah. seems to be kind of like, you know, because I was looking at, at Frank's background, your new partner, and, mm -hmm. and I knew Mike Galley, and, and, and Frank comes in and he really has more of a path like a lot of the kids today. Yeah. You know, he went to school and he got into it a little bit later in life. You know, we started out with go-karts when we were in sixth grade, mm -hmm. build our own stuff, yeah. right? But that path, when did you make the leap? When did you leave the school and say, hey, you know, because you worked, did you go back and work for Warren? No, I, I, I stayed and I worked from at that school up until 2006. Mm -hmm. And uh, being that we're in the school, we placed a lot of people in the industry. So we had a lot of contacts out there. Oh, sure. we, so we would place people. Um, I knew the crew chiefs for KB Racing, uh, Jeff Purley and Rob Downing. Right, they, we had, they'd come through the school a few times looking for guys. And so I called Purley up and I said, hey, man, I'm, I'm, I'm looking to you know, get into pro stock. I, 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 this is what I went to school for. This is what I want to do. This is why I, my goal as an engine builder, I want to work on NHRA pro stock. That, that's a, that's like the pinnacle for me and he's like well you know quite honestly we're looking for somebody and that, that, that wasn't the intention to go there i just right. want to know if he'd heard anything because it, people you know sure, keep you in the ground yeah. yeah yeah so uh but uh he says can you fly out they were there on west coast swing there in seattle he says can you fly out to seattle this weekend and i'm like absolutely so i flew out there i uh, uh got there um greg anderson is the one that picked me up from the airport and it, so it was, it was like, it's a, it's a small world, it, isn't it? It's a really weird deal, right? And so we, I get out there. <clears throat> um, Pearly shows me that they, so they, need, they need, didn't need specifically an engine guy. They needed a, a, a clutch and transmission guy, our guy driver rig. I have a CDL, you know, I have a commercial driver's license. So uh, he, they needed somebody and eventually would work uh, in the engine shop as well. So I went out there and, and uh, he said, you ever seen a pro stock clutch before? I'm like, nope. And uh, it's got this little tiny multi-disc thing. And he says... Here's how to set it up. Here's how to take it apart. Here's how to clean it, which is no big. I worked on lots of stuff before, and so I get this thing in the car, and he's like, "All right, it's ready for Q1." I'm like, "Wait a minute, what's that? that I'm I don't even work here, and, and this is in the car." He's like, "You did it right. We'll see what happens." And I, I don't get I don't get sketched out, but the first time that I put something in a, a pro stock car and they drop the hammer out the first time, I was like, "I want to hope it doesn't come flying out the bottom, right?" So yeah, right. Six seconds. What were you running? Yeah, yeah. That, that, you know, this this is the back in the. So it was like <clears> late nineties. No, this, this, yeah, this, no, you said 2006. So this yeah. was back in the in the days of uh, you know the DRCE uh, two iteration the engines, but these cars are you know six sixties at two ten, right. you know, and uh, but uh, so I worked on the car the whole weekend. At the end of the uh, at the end of the weekend, um, I go up into the uh, up into the lounge where Ken Black he's up there, and uh, I go up there and, and they said, hey, we want to see you in the office here up in the front, and I go in there, it's like a tribunal, right? It's Ken Black, it's Jason Line, it's Greg Anderson, it's Jeff Purley, it's Rob Downing, it's all, it's all the, the heavy hitters, right? It's, they said, yeah, I, I just want to know, we, we really like him, like, want to know if you want to come to work? And, and you're gone. I'm in pro stock. Just take your Fairmont with you? <laughs> I wish. I, <laughs> I, I, like an idiot, I sold that car. I yeah. wish I had half the stuff I sold, I, I should have had, but yeah, but I was in pro stock, and in pro stock, I did a lot of fun stuff, right? And uh I did engine valve. You know, we, we not only I did the clutch and transmission. Well, I thought you were crew chief. No, nope, I was never so a crew you were, chief. You were always on engines. <clears throat> always on engines. Well, what we, what I, I, I was did the clutch and transmission on Greg's car. Yeah. And uh, that's a you know we work on Liberty five speeds and these clutches and, and uh, you, so you build a transmission a different gear set every round and then I transitioned in, into engines because I started doing engine development and I, from I, I've been a, I've been a machinist uh, you know but I'm a an actual automotive machinist uh, I've done tool and die machining I've done uh, a whole bunch of stuff I got a lot of experience with this machining stuff and engine building and so um that being said 
I uh, eventually worked into the engine shop. And uh, then I did R and D as well. So we, so we we did all kinds of good. good but stuff. your background has always been you've always come back to engines, always come yeah. back to machining. You mm -hmm. know, um, when when I visited Gurney's shop, you know, uh, Phil Remington, I, he was still alive when I visited. That was in two thousand, probably a little bit after you were doing there. Yeah, uh, two thousand two, <clears throat> two thousand two to two thousand four, we were working with Gurney. Mm -hmm. He was looking to sell some, you know, Westlake Gurney heads and some parts. Oh, they weren't. Wow. The Gulf War <clears throat> came and their business just took off with basically drone parts. Gurney had one of the biggest autoclaves on the West Coast. Wow. And so they were doing yeah. a lot of carbon fiber parts for race cars and they transitioned to drone parts and that's where they made tons of money. Wow. But Dan was such a gentleman. But you kind of, you know, I always like to kind of see who reflects whose career. Um, when I got to work with Joey Logano, I said, God, he reminds me of a young Gurney. He's a good scientist. He's a modest guy. He's kind. He's decent. He's kind of the guy that I really kind of look up to. Gurney was like, he spent three hours with me. Dan Gurney, right? And who am I? Yeah, right. yeah that's good. Around cool. his shop, signed a poster <clears throat> for me and stuff. And But in his shop, working on an old pushrod Harley motor, yeah. it was making 48 horsepower and he's getting 110 horse out of it, right? Yeah. Was Phil Remington. Yeah. And so you kind of are like Phil. Phil was the 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 guy that, remember they're saying, if you want to finish first, first you have to finish. Mm -hmm. Phil was that guy who kept the the Shelby machines running and working and finishing races. And, mm -hmm. and people don't give a lot of credit to the guys behind the scene that make sure the cars don't break. Right. And so you're kind of the modern day Phil Remington. And that's it, a huge compliment. You it, know? I appreciate that. You know, it's, it's funny. We always, uh, we always talk about the drivers and the cars. They, they wear the Nomex cologne, you know? <laughs> so, uh, but, but there, there, there's a, it's a whole thing's a team effort, right? And every, everyone likes, like when I was at KB, the, they're the first to admit this is a 100% team effort. We have, we had, a, we had a small crew, but we had a very dedicated crew. We were paid to win. That that's that was our job. We we didn't, didn't do it recreationally. This wasn't a like a fun. Uh, wasn't someone's toy box. We, it was this was our career, right? So how do you go from <clears throat> from instruction and teaching to racing, and then what brought you to RTM and teaching again? Because really, what you're doing is you're you're full circle back to your teaching career. You know, very very much so. Um, it's just it was it was just a, a fortuitous events, right? So um, <clears throat> summit racing. Uh, the ma major sponsor of obviously the KB Racing. Um, also worked. Well, uh, were you working with Nan Gellhart back then? Yeah. Was she involved yeah. in the racing program? Yeah, yeah. Holy yeah. cow. Yep, Nan and uh, and Jim Greenleaf and, and people yep. like that. <clears throat> the um, because someone put a lot of money in drag racing, and yeah. they still do. And yeah. obviously, and, you, know, you know, read they're, their catalog; it's always car after car. So you were working with Summit in 08, 09. 10. Yeah, yeah, they're they're the primary sponsor on our cars, right? And so uh, they had to come through and they had to do some stuff for back then. It's called RTM, right? Uh, which is a uh, power nation now, and uh, they would do some stuff with uh, the drivers, you know, do some product features and things like that. So the production crew from from RTM would come in, and uh, we did some stuff, and they they would do some stuff with Greg and Jason, and we we did an engine for Jason's wagon that he built and things like that but uh aside from that we had some stuff that we were doing um say elmore was there uh yep. my buddy elmore we got god rest his soul and uh it, it, yeah, we, we need to talk about joe briefly we, we but will. yeah we'll, we'll circle back i i circled here before we start yeah, talking yeah but uh so so uh we were there and i i, so I was talking to elmore and we, and, uh, we were talking about some stuff and he, they, i actually they, they wanted some filler for some stuff that we did so i had to i did he says can you like talk about something of uh, just any part i'm like yeah i can Talk about whatever you want. He says, "How about how about pistons?" And so we got some piston stuff in. I just we were talking. And you about just started riffing. Yeah, I started riffing, and uh, and when all said and done, when, when the thing was done, Elmore he calls me up. He's like, "Hey, uh, I know you're you know having fun getting rich in pro stock, but he said uh, we'd love you to come to work for us." This was like uh, 2008 or nine. Yeah, and I'm like. Absolutely not. I said, I'm living my dream. I'm, I'm in NHRA pro stock. This is what I've always wanted to do since this was my goal. And uh, he's like, you know, I understand, I understand. And then, you know, fast forward to. Uh, but when you were pro, where were you living at that time? I was, I was in, uh, in, in, in the North Carolina area, uh, okay. Mooresville, uh, Troutman, North Carolina area. Yeah, and you married? Uh, yeah, yeah, and you're married with a race habit, which uh, is an exceptional. Well, that the, the great thing about yeah. it is my 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 beautiful wife Kelly. She she's uh um, she's got this stuff as as bad as I do, probably worse. She actually wrote the biography that's out right now about Warren Johnson. So she, she's a published author, you know, and she, uh, she, she's the rock star, you know. So I didn't know that this is, and I don't think a lot of people know this about you. That helps having the support on the home front. Cause yeah. we see it all the time. The car guys that have that car habit and then the wife that doesn't like, it. we call it the wife acceptance factor. <laughs> you got the wife participation factor. I tell you, I, I, I met, collaboration. Yeah. Just for a quick sidebar. I, that's how I met my wife. We, uh, we had set the national record for ET in Pomona, California one year. And uh, just by happenstance, she was following, because uh, she worked for National Dragster, she was following NHRA tech around. 
And so I'm turning the engine apart, and so we can we can we can get everything certified and, and get it, make sure we're legal. And she was with the, with the tech people, right? And she's in there, and I'm I'm pulling the engine apart, and I pull a head gasket up. She's like, "That's a head gasket." And I'm like, "You're right." And then then <laughs> now we we've been we've been married. I love you. Know, yeah, I, I love you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, so, so we so we, now we've we've been married uh, this this December. It'll be ten years. So. Congratulations, yeah, man. man. That's really cool, and that's kind of like a dream come true because a lot of guys, you know, we see it, and you don't want. To ever have a, a a passion or a hobby that kind of rubs you know right. against the grain, you want to go smooth. That's that's exceptional. Let's let's circle back. So now, and and was was Bobby because Ta- I know Bob Tasca mm-hmm. and and we've been lucky to work with him. Um, <clears throat> he started in pro stock, I think. I, I they're running a Mustang. They they uh that Tasca obviously they have a s- oh, yeah, long yeah, history yeah. of racing, right? And, and I think a lot of people did a lot of stuff. Uh, but if, when did he go full time NHRA? It had I, to be 2012, it, 2011. It's somewhere in there, yeah. But he you know he's with a funny car thing, and, yeah. uh, and and he's still still a great competitor to this but day. But did you ever run against him in pro stock? No, no. I don't never, remember when he was, and I could have my my years. Yeah, off. no. Sometimes it's, it, with with what goes on there, it's kind of hard to keep track of everything. Oh yeah, there's a lot. Of, um, so let's let's go back. So now you're at RTM. Mm-hmm. And, you know, did you move down to, what, Nashville? Yeah, yeah. Close I, to I, Franklin? I moved you guys from, are out of Franklin. Yeah, we're out, we're out of Franklin, Tennessee. I moved from uh, the North Carolina, which was the, say, Mooresville area, basically. That's the, the mecca of, of, of circle track racing and all that. So, uh, but uh, I did that in 2014. But, but before I, uh, uh, let's say, I, I turned the job down early. And then, you know, later they, they offered me the job again. I'm like, lightning doesn't strike twice. So I really started looking at it because we had to do some other stuff. Was with it them. Joe again who offered you? No, job? it was, uh, it was uh, um, um, Tom Spy is who it was. Yeah. It was one of, one of our producers. And, and they went back and they, they looked at this footage and uh, of the things we did. And they said, you know, we, we'd really love you to consider this again. And, and, and then, then I did. And I went and, and uh, everything's now, uh, I've been there since say 10 years. Yeah, you have. Yeah. So you started out, was Mike your first partner? Yeah. Yeah. I yeah, got, so Mike I, went I got then, right in there with, uh, with Mike Galley. Uh, yeah. you know, he's, he's a very, very talented individual. You know, he's, he's yeah, we a, had fun working with you guys. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You were here last when we were building the hot rod truck. I wrote down just so I could remember, cause we've done so much. We did that GTM before you were there. Mm-hmm. And then uh, we did the Mark IV with Tommy and Rick mm-hmm. on the c- comparison with the original car. Mm-hmm. And the reason I mentioned Tasca is because we had Z-Max Drag Race, right? Yeah. And what people don't know is, you know, we didn't want to pay for the strip. So <laughs> I knew the manager and he's like, hey, I'll give you an hour or two in the morning. Right. But they didn't prep the strip and it was it was cold. It was like <laughs> 55 degrees, yeah, right? Yeah. And Bobby Tasca goes down with the original Cobra and it was a 427. And, and as, as mythic and legendary as those cars are, you know, a 50 year old car right. with a 427 and i think it was a 429 motor in it mm-hmm. um it it wasn't as fast as as the legend and he didn't have great tires on sure it. but the track surface was greasy as all hell mm-hmm. and bobby task and i were drag racing back down pit lane yeah just on regular concrete and we're like can we set up the drags over here because we could hook up better jim was like i'm not driving that car because it was it was treacherous <laughs> it was with the coyote powered mark four okay yeah and it was the first mark four we had the coyote went in it and that motor is like a sewing machine. It just goes right up to 7,800 RPM yeah. and it goes right to red line. It doesn't nose over at all and just shift to the next gear. Problem is I was spinning tires first, second, third gear. It was kind of scary. Mm-hmm. And we didn't run very good times, but the comparison between the original car and ours, it was just, you know, it, it's like everything else. Technology has changed materials, suspension, tires, you know, power delivery, everything, transmissions. It's just a much better car. Yeah. And that's kind of why we've done well is our Cobras look like the original cars, but they handle better and all that. But that was, God, it seems like 2000, maybe 12 or 13, we okay. did that show. All right. Then we did uh, the Rattle Can Hot Rod yep. and the Flame 33. I think it wasn't uh, it wasn't Summit Racing. I think it was, um, it had to be Peachy. PPG came out with that water-based paint mm-hmm. and, you know, environmental paints were all the rage. And the water-based paints to do a flame paint job I mean, the stuff just didn't flash fast. And I, th- I can't remember. The woman was Joanne Bortles. Remember her? Oh, uh, Crazy yeah. Horse Painting? Yeah. She did the flames. And I, I think it took 10 years off her life to get those flames to cure <laughs> and dry. And, but I still have the car down in the showroom. And Joanne did another car for us. But when we got involved was really, I think the big show that we did was with the prototype, the first hot rod truck. The yeah, no, that, that was spectacular. It was snap on and you guys came in. You built it here. Yeah. So having you back here was kind of fun. All the other stuff up to that point. That hot rod truck really boosted our sales in hot rods because we had a 33. Mm-hmm. It was doing well. We we revved it to a Gen 2 33. Then we added a pickup truck and we added the Speedstar. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if you remember Rat's Glass. Oh, know? no. Yeah. I, those were my favorite bodies. When I, George when Long. I, yep. When I found out you guys were, uh, you know, that you've acquired that, I was, I was, I was, I was It was a good story because George and, and I knew I wanted to do something with a Speedstar and you guys and we never did. Joanne painted flames on that one mm-hmm. to match, but... 
George calls me up and he wants to sell the company. And I, I said, George, look, I, I'm not going to rip you off. I go buy a Speedstar right now. But what I want is your Speedstar. That was the Riddler Award winning body. Right. And so we bought that. The rest of his molds I had in the back for two years and I just scrapped them. You know, he had a Vicky and some other stuff that mm -hmm. we decided not to do. But the Speedstar, we put it on our chassis and it was really close. We made some minor changes, but that's a beautiful hot rod body. Mm -hmm. But that hot rod truck was kind of the the stake in the ground that, that sales really started picking up because a lot of the younger kids, it seems like we build cars that our grandparents had that was cool. Mm -hmm. But if our dad had, it's not cool. It's kind of <laughs> weird. You yeah. know, the kids don't want to be like their dad. Well, that hot rod and the hot rod pickup truck and the Speedstar now, from a from a market share standpoint, our hot rods are doing better than I would have expected. Because I always thought hot rods were kind of on the downside. I mean, mm. they, the pre-48 stuff was kind of, you know, those were World War II veterans coming back. And those guys getting older and not building cars anymore. Mm. But you built that hot rod truck here. And got, and that was a cool, that was a, was it a? It was a it was a Weber carburetor. What was the yeah, carburetor? There were three Strombers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. And you were the only guy that knew how to tune. Yeah. <laughs> and that's, there's some you've seen that that meme where there's a pyramid it goes all the way up. And then at the very top is like people who still know how to tune carburetors. I I, I kind of fall into that one. I'm I'm really old school, and and Frankie always gives me all kinds of hell because you know I, I he, he's a from from his standpoint he's a young guy he, he does a very good job he's got a lot of education and he likes electronic fuel injection he's very very skilled at at wiring and setting things right. up and we've done a few things where you know before in the past where these kits weren't where they are now but now everything runs so much better but it still it takes it takes knowledge to make the stuff run well, all our guys looked at us and were like I don't, no one knows how to do and and you always know when someone has expertise and industry experience and kind of lifetime experience because that who would have known how to do that? If it wasn't you, nobody within 50 miles of here knew how to do that. <laughs> that's so those were, that's yeah. hilarious. And, and they tuned it well, ran well. Yeah, no, ran, ran yeah. great. I, I remember because uh, I'm talking and they say, hey, what, what do you think about this? And I'm like, no problem. Well, let's, let's make it happen. And uh, and uh, that, that, that was fun. And that, that whole truck, that whole experience building that thing, how nice it was. And, and you know, I was as it went together, I'm like, I, I just, the more you work on it, the more excited you get about it. You're like, you, you really have something here, right? And uh, I knew that was going to be a hit. I'm, we were so, you know, flattered that we got to build the first one you know and then and then it was funny because we fired it up drove it out drove it right in the box and it went to SEMA. yeah you know? this is an important point and i think that for people who are interested in getting into the car business you know um if if i use an off-car comment I, we would say it's a gypsy business but the car business is um it's really strange it attracts a lot of guys mm -hmm. so a lot of guys come to it and they like the flash and the and the and the excitement of it but about 20% of the industry is some of the most competent, serious professionals you'll ever meet. Mm -hmm. The rest, there's a lot of fluff to the industry. You go to SEMA and there's all this flash. And I know, I get it. But our success has come, you know, my father always said, surround yourself with great people. And, and, and you guys, you know, normally broadcast companies have the, you know, the, hey. And this, and, <laughs> but the, the competence behind it, RTM has done a good job of making sure that the wrenches are, are legit. And, and Frankie's resume is not as long as yours, but he's got some pretty good experience. I, he loves engines. That's what I like yeah, about him. Yeah, I, I wish I was at his stage at you know back then. You know, I'd be I'd, I'd be way further ahead in my career, I think. But, but uh, think about the technology we got today. Yeah, I mean, if you compare what you were doing even in the the mid '90s, yeah. to the engines today, mm -hmm. the crate engines. I mean, I remember '87, '93 Mustangs, 225 horse, hyper eutectic pistons, the, yeah. the 302. Mm -hmm. That was that was big stuff. Yep, sure was. It's a minivan today. I mean, it's like the engine technology is <laughs> unbelievable. Yeah, it's crazy how good stuff is nowadays, and and, and, and unintentionally good. You know, kind of like a Godzilla. You know? Yeah, that's just a, that's a great engine. But everybody was so down on emissions. I remember in the seventies, I had a VW Bug and all that crap, and 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 you know, engines made no power, and then they even made less power when emissions started coming yep. in. And it took till mid eighties, maybe even to the nineties, where emissions and efficiency and and horsepower started all coming along. Mm -hmm. Now, I mean, you look at some of the engines. Super clean burning, super efficient, yep. super modern, and 500 horsepower. Yeah, and they make good you know? power. Yeah, yeah, and they make good power reliable. If you have an engine that you say 500 horse and you can run it 100,000 miles, you you that was unheard of. So, yeah. so you drove in the cars yesterday, and, and it was interesting because you were driving with Jim, and I'm more of a miscreant with mm -hmm. the cars. I like <laughs> to get them a little sideways, but. Yeah. It's hard for me to, without being on a track, to know how a car really, the nature of the car. Yeah. I can get it loose in a parking lot and drive around. But, but I, I went to bed last night. I was just thinking about that car and that Godzilla motor. It still drives like a big, it drives like a 60s motor. Yeah. It just, it makes a lot of power. Mm -hmm. It's got good torque. Mm -hmm. It just felt like more of a, of a vintage car. Yeah. Whereas I'm so used to these, you know. The LS motors, the LS7 that's in my GTM is such mm -hmm. a great motor. It's a hand-built dry sump. 
Um, the coyotes are just so good mm-hmm. at fuel delivery. And I think one of the things that was distracting me is the off idle on that. You just, that first maybe quarter throttle mm-hmm. just kind of stumbles mm-hmm. and then the engine comes on. And I think that's just program. We just plug that, that in. Is, yeah, no, there's, there's we didn't whole, do any tuning at all. Right. There's got to be some tuning that has to happen with that, which is no big deal. That's expected on these. And you know, the fact that we ran drive, ran drive for fine. Oh God. Yeah. Yeah. yeah but what, was, what are your thoughts about the modular motors versus kind of the push rod traditional, which, which those things are catching yeah. up in power. It's amazing. Yeah. And I, I'm a, I'm again, I'm a traditionalist, right. And, and I'm, I'm kind of old school, right. Uh, the, 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 I remember when the, the mod motor came into fashion, right? And, and when Ford made the conscious effort to start to do this, and it, it was a, a lot of it was a money thing, but it doesn't mean that, that the heads moved a lot of air, so they made good power. Even naturally aspirated, before you even put boost to them, that's because that's the, obviously the common thing is you take these things and, you It know, took them a while to get them straight, though. Yeah. Because we blew up like two, four, sixes on the track. We were the first guys who knew that oil pan didn't scavenge well. Yeah, there, and, there's always, there's going to be some growing pains on that. But uh, you know the the trend now the the, the push rod engine. I'm, I'm an old push rod guy. The, the the other stuff is great. It's just uh, sometimes it's a little it's a little more complex and uh, it just gives you more failure points. And I, I don't really like that part because you know even like like with, with multiple timing chains in it and, and making sure that you know you can the cams are separate so you can degree them any way you want. But when something goes south in them, it wrecks a lot of stuff, right? Uh, push rod engines aren't quite as bad as that, and they're a little bit more on the simpler side, a little bit more straightforward on the design, and uh, they're they're a little bit easier on on part slot because the, the, like if you have like for instance the Coyote, great engine, three hundred and two inches, but to make any power you have to turn it eight thousand, right? Now the exact opposite is it just this, doesn't have the torque. It, it doesn't have, it doesn't have torque. It has a lot of power, but like this this four hundred and forty five inch seven three that's in that car, um, that that's built to make torque. That that thing's all done, you know, in a stock configuration. That thing's all done by fifty five hundred. But until then, you know, this thing's got you know five hundred, you know, five hundred plus pound feet of torque and over five hundred horsepower. And you didn't even have to do anything to it. So well, we had a guy with the three twenty. Uh, what was it? The three fifty one Windsor mm-hmm. is common stroke to four twenty seven, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And a guy that runs the gym that I work at in Water of Cobra, he had one built for him, and. You know, uh, Blueprint is such a great company. Yeah. And but they're also a slave to that number. They want to get that top end number, right? Mm-hmm. So they'll put a carb that's a little too big on the engine. So we got this Windsor in, and there was an issue with the engine. Um, Blueprint stood by it. They're such a great company. We've done work with them for over ten years, mm-hmm. and um, um, they swapped some parts out. And while the engine was here, I had our guys change the carb to a seven fifty from an eight fifty, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And so we added probably eighty foot pounds of torque. Mm-hmm. And, and tuned that engine for mm-hmm. torque and lost probably a good 80, 100 horsepower off the mm-hmm. top. And I gave it back to Al and he drove it. And here's a guy who just doesn't know a lot about engines. And he goes, what did you do? You added so much horsepower. I'm like, yeah, yeah, we just added a ton of horsepower, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, but yeah. so one of the most common questions guys have, and and you're kind of the front seat of the engine wars, mm-hmm. is a guy will be building a factory five. Is like, what engine should I, if you look at one of um, Mad Dog, one of the best episodes we did was just that ad hoc in the showroom talking about the different cars and different engines, right? So yeah, so you got push rod 302s, we got the 351s and the 347 strokers, the 363 I think Ford has now. Um, I think we did a 392. Um, we did a 427 side oiler, an old school one. Then we talked about the modular motors, the 46, the 50s for sure, and the 52 illuminator. Uh, I think we did at the time, I don't think we had the illuminator with the, the boost on it with the supercharger, but that was a really popular episode. Mm-hmm. But if you were talking about nature of driving cars, because most customers can't jump in a 289 Cobra and a 427 Cobra with different engines, we get the the luck of being able to do that. Mm-hmm. But from an engine standpoint, if I said, okay, you've got a Mark IV, mm-hmm. you got a factory five you're building, yeah. and you can build either a Coyote 5.0, mm-hmm. and it's like the new 5.0, the Gen 4, they got the engine controls and everything released, that's 480 horsepower. Yeah. And close to 8,000 RPM. Yeah. And there are some tricks you can do to get it right to there. Mm-hmm. Um, or I'm going to say, let's compare that to the Godzilla motor. Mm-hmm. 450 horse, much better torque. Yeah. And tunable. Mm-hmm. You said you could probably upgrade the cam and do some other stuff to get that another 50, 80 horsepower. Oh, yeah. That. No, they're, they're, they're super simple. You're, compare those two engines. And, it it and, all and, depends and, on what you want. I, I, again, a lot of people, they, uh, they, they, li- they love it. Uh, the idea of right, racing on a track, some people never will. And so uh, everyone's, uh, uh, they love RPM, right? Because when you hear something that turns a lot of RPM, makes a lot of noise, that's just cool. Uh, I, there's nothing uh, There's nothing that's cooler than hearing an engine at, at full song, right? But um, from a practicality standpoint, it's I think a lot of people are way happier with something that's a little bit lower RPM, but I mean, just throws you right back in the seat. Because you can do that with, with something that has a smaller inch that you turn a lot of RPM, but you're 
to get to, to, to feel the same way. You're sidestepping the clutch at six thousand instead of just like sidestepping the clutch at twenty five hundred, and you're like, oh my god, it's like I'm shot out of a cannon, you know. So it, it all it, it's it's people have very distinct driving styles. I, I can tell you that I run out of talent so fast in a car. It, it, it you know I, I'm horrible at turning left right. Every time we go somewhere, and Frankie and I go somewhere, uh, I, I get sick. I get car sick. I make myself car sick. And so, and, and so when we're doing all this stuff driving around, it's kind of fun because if you're in these cars that are really, really light, throwing them around, and they're turning all these RP, RPMs, that's that's a distinct driving style than to, like, you know, I, I drive like Miss Daisy, right? So I, I just very, very low RPM. You know, drag stuff's different now. That's that's totally different. If, if if I have something that I have this suck the eyeballs right out of you and take off, that's what I'm that's what you're looking for. But if I gotta turn right or left, I I'm 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 almost useless. If you picked one, which would pick? I I I I, I I'd, Sounds like you go for Godzilla. I'd, I'd go for, school, I'd, I'd, I would go for the big bigger engines. I, yep. Big displacement. Yep. Um, they last longer per se. You know, again, there's nothing that, that that says that that a high RPM engine built right won't last as long. Yeah, but that right. resonance, that thump thump thump, that it, just it, feeling. It's, it's, you can yeah. feel it in the ground, and I really yeah. like that. You know, it's, it's kind of old school. Different right? animals. I mean, Di- for me, totally different animals. For me, if I go to track, that coyote gives me so much more bandwidth to work with shifting. Oh yeah. So I might be able to leave it in second gear through two turns. Um, it gives me kind of an engine that has really good precise metering. But on the street, I know what the guys want. They want that bragging rights. Absolutely. They want that. And this is the, I think this is the largest displacement. We ran a 460. Remember the old Crate yeah. 460? Yeah. That was a drag race motor. It had mm-hmm. a huge intake, no torque. It didn't have big block torque. It had high end rush. It was a, dr- this motor feels like what I would imagine back in the 60s when they dropped the 427. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Yeah. You know, just big torque, big low horsepower. Yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, um, Anything else? What, uh, let's just circle before we leave, because um, you got such good stories. Joe Elmore and, um, you know, all of us have been, if, if you're successful in your career, I doubt you've been successful without someone teaching you. Right. And, and, and the people who are really successful, the ones that recognize the teachers they've had, you know, you got to know Joe. He passed away recently. And it was a real ch- I really like the guy. He's one of those guys who was really genuine and mm-hmm. kind. He always took time yeah. to explain things to me. And I'd come and check out your set and we'd be looking to you know sponsor an episode or something like that and he'd always like hey how's it going yeah and the first time i I worked with him we go on camera and and he was introducing Mm -hmm. um i don't even remember what episode it was um and we're talking just like this and then all of a sudden they go okay five four you know action you know and joe goes welcome to horsepower (laughs) i i i I jumped i startled right and they're like cut you know how can and i'm like could he talk different but he had a good kind of a Hollywood presence, didn't he? No, he was amazing. And tell me about your stories about how you know Joe and, and what stands out in your mind. You know, he is absolutely amazing. I first got to meet him when we, you know, when uh, you know the production company came to KB and we did some stuff, and and that's how I got to talking to him, right? And uh, he was, he, he, I, I've never met a man more professional. He, he was the consummate professional. I mean, you think TV, you think Joe Elmore, especially in automotive. I, if you if you can fathom. How many millions, that's not an exaggeration, how many millions of people he inspired to get into this industry? Because it's it's far-reaching. Everybody knows Elmore. I've never heard one person say one bad word about Joe Elmore because there, there's nothing to, to, to say that's bad. Um, he was professional. And again, teaching me, that which was important, I'm a... I, I'm a machinist. I'm an engine builder, right? So I have, now I have to. They're pointing a the camera at me, and I have to make some sort of coherent, you know, sentences and all that. And I told him, if, if you you could you get somebody way prettier and way better at this to do my job, right? But uh, you know, the engine parts the, is the important part. And then we talked about that. You know, we because we come in as professionals. You know, we're, we are not TV people. Joe, he's a TV person, but he, he's he's an enthusiast, right? Yeah. And so I, you you want to talk about history? You want to talk about you know options on cars he just him you know when him and chuck were they 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 would just lay it all out and uh they were uh they were the inspiration for again uh for me i i used to watch him i remember believe it or not when i was uh when i was working at kb when i build transmissions in the morning for on sunday morning for race day yes every sunday morning power nation power block on on the tv was when i was building transmissions i was watching elmore you know so it it was it was kind of neat but uh just a, a fantastic just all around human being well, I'd, I'd give you a good compliment. I said you're kind of the modern day, you know, iteration of a uh, '60s uh, Phil Remington, but you're also kind of bringing Joe Elmore's, you know, kind of um, good karma and good business practices and and real deep competence uh, to you know new generation. It's kind of fun. Yeah, it's 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 super fun. You know, I'd say we we uh, what I'm very proud about our place, and you you mentioned it. You know, we the wrenches that are in the in the building. 
they're, they're, they're legit, right? Um, it, it's easy to have someone come in and say lines and then leave. And, and we don't have any ninja crews. We do all yeah, work. Right. 80% of the work that we do is off camera, right? So it's, it's not like, Mr. Topolinsky, we're ready for your, you know, you're ready for your, your, your stand up. No, we, uh, Frankie and I will be there at 10 o'clock at night on Saturday setting rod bearing clearance because we have to shoot Monday, right? So we, yeah. we, we do what we, we're very proud that we do the work. And if, it, if you see it, we did it. We're, we're, we're the technical producers of the show. So that being said, you know, we, 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 we're the ones that, uh, you know, decide what goes in what. Everything is application specific. So we build stuff for the building. So no, no matter what it is, or someone else has a project, they got a car, boat, truck, you know, what, whatever the case may be. Yep. Um, engines are pretty easy because they say, how much power do you want to make and how long do you want to make it for? It's pretty, That's awesome, man. It's pretty simple. Well, we really have had a lot of fun having you out here. And every time we work together, I learn stuff from you. Um, I think the crew does. Our job is trying to make your job easy, you know. Um, I remember, I there's I probably can't tell the story about Tommy Bozier, but uh, you know, <laughs> I, maybe you can edit this out. Yeah, edit I like that. stories. Or maybe like bleep it out or whatever. It was great because when, when we did the Mark IV, you know, the – Sometimes, and you know, some of these cars, you know, that we build have a lot of horsepower. They're short wheel based, yeah. you know, they're good car control, good sports cars, but you can get over your head. And we were watching, you know, Rick uh, drive and mm -hmm. he was kind of a hooligan. And I'm like, eh. and, and behind the scenes, <laughs> we're always trying to say, how do we set up these guys for success? We want right. to make sure the right guys in the right car. Right. And we're like, yeah, you know, Tommy's much more mature and he's a circle track. I think he does demolition derby, yeah, right? Demolition derby. Um, yeah. But he's actually a good scientist and he really, and I like Tommy a lot. And so we're like, Hey, yeah, let's have Tommy drive and not Rick. Cause Rick is going to wreck the car. Right. <laughs> and, uh, and so then we do the show and Tommy drives and uh, everybody's happy. And no, I think Rick drove half of it and Tommy drove half. Anyway, afterwards, we're down at some bar in Charlotte. There's like a NASCAR cafe or something. Mm -hmm. And we're drinking beers. And apparently, I was a little too candid with Tommy because I was like, hey, Tommy, you know, we're really glad because we wanted you to drive. You know, and, you said, and Tommy goes, oh, you wanted Tommy to drive because he's a, and he used a different word to describe himself. But, <laughs> and, uh, and everybody laughs so hard, but we just yeah. really got along with the crew. Our yeah. job is trying to make you guys, you know, job easy, but you always make our cars look good and, and the guys love working with you. And, you know, the stories you have are, are you know, these are inspiring. These are stories of our lives, you know. Well, I and, tell you. Uh, working, get credit career. Yeah, work, working where we work, it's I, I can say the same thing. You know, when, you know our, when we work with something, like we know something, everything's going to come in, everything's going to fit, everything's going to work like it should. Um, that, that's a pleasure, right? And uh, there's there's places like this. Sometimes you, sometimes things are a little bit more challenging. Um, never worry about you guys. You, you, you always got your stuff together, and it's it's always a pleasure to work. And you you always do really cool stuff. You're constantly innovating stuff. You're constantly working on. It, it, it's easy to just say, hey, we we got this great combination. Let's say we got a Mark IV. It's, it's a great car. It's best selling car there is, right? That, that for 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 that for this type of. Kick, right. You know, yeah. Definitely. It's our best seller. Yeah. But, 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 but it could be easy to say, no, we're, we're good. We don't have to do anything, but you're, you're constantly, we, we just, we, we just drove one, you know? So if you gave someone uh, a young kid starting out mm -hmm. his advice, you know, my advice to kids are always the same. A lot of guys, uh, a lot of college kids send the resumes in, they want an internship and they're like, you know, what advice would you give me? Mm -hmm. And I always say, you know, um, if, if I was looking at any industry, I like the I like the undergraduate degree that that gives you an education and the postgraduate degree or the internship or the apprenticeship that gives you hands-on knowledge. When you do those two things are different, but a classic education and then you've had a, a, a real hands-on background. In, in my experience, respect your craft. So you love engines mm -hmm. and that love for engines has driven your whole career. And and all the other success comes from that that complete commitment to engines and machining and craft. Not a lot of people have that. If you focus on that, I think all the other success comes along. On my side, I think if you're in the car business, you have to respect business. You have to run a good... How many guys know how to you know, paint a car, but they can't balance a checkbook? Right? Right. And it doesn't help if you're not in business 10 years from now. You know, right. My customers rely on Factory 5 to be here, been for 29 years. So respecting the biology of business and how to pay the bills and do it the right way. But what advice would you give a young guy he's... A sophomore in high school, he just mm -hmm. got his first car. It's a Honda probably, you know, yeah. hand down, different cars, different generations. Mm -hmm. What advice would you give him if he just loves cars and he wants to go into this industry and he's looking at you as a role model? What would you say to your young self or to him 
to give him a, a start. Oh, if, if follow it. If you, if you want to do it, you do it. Don't listen to people. You know, because there's people that are curmudgeon in this business. Like, oh, you can't. If you do want it. to do it, do it. If you want to do it, just do it. I, I my wife always gets mad at me because I said it's easy. You just do it. And and that that statement seems pretty simple, right? But when you focus on this is what you're going to do, right? And you're going to have people say you can't make any money at it. It's not going to. It's not doesn't have. And any, it is hard to make money in the car industry. One hundred percent. It's about sustainability. But I, I, there's two things that you, you stick with it, and the world doesn't owe you anything. There's, there's no, there's no sense. That's an old fashioned notion. There's no sense of entitlement, right? It's just because you, again, there's people that have come out with an education and say, you know, I'm just going to come in here and kick some ass or whatever like that. It doesn't work like that. Um, the, the, you have to put in the work. You, it's hard to train work ethic. I, I, I almost argue that you almost can't, but because you either have it or you don't, you either want to do something or you don't. Right. And there's no one that's going to hand it to you. I, I, no matter how lucky someone thinks they are or whatever, it's never going to get handed to you. You have to put in the work, but the, you have to stick with it. I mean, there's going to be some times where you're like, boys, I, I don't know what the hell I think, I think, I think I'm doing, right? But if it, you truly enjoy and truly love what you do, you'll never work a day in your life. I mean, people will always ask, you know, like in racing, just for an example, um, we would work 100 hours a week. People are like, oh, I bet you that that's horrible. Right? I'm like, no, I, I, how, how can that be horrible? You know, I'm, we're doing all this fun stuff. We're racing. We're, we're working on stuff. We're learning the whole time. We're getting paid to learn, basically. And, and we, this, is, this is the life you choose, right? There's, you'll, if you enjoy what you do, you'll never work a day in your life. I know that's cliche, but it's, the, abs advice. it's, it's the absolute yeah. truth. So, so if you're talking to young kids, you say stick with it. Yeah. The world doesn't owe you anything. Yeah. And that's true. You got to work and you got to earn it. There's just so many people out there that are willing to work hard. And you got to put the time in and, and be married to a craft. Um, Pat, really, thanks for coming out, man. Wow. It's been it's always fun working with you guys. We'll, we'll see you at SEMA, right? Yeah, man, we'll be there. So right. yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll have work. some stuff at SEMA. And then I think that Godzilla motor is fun. I, I want to get that throttle thing. And and can you upgrade that engine? Can you change that cam without taking the engine out of the car? Yeah. It's you think a, there's enough clearance it, to get it, that it, cam it, out? Probably. I mean, I just, probably. <laughs> I mean, with the radiator and stuff like that, maybe yeah. it, it's, it's not a difficult operation. I'll it's pull just, it out if we have to. Just pull it out, but uh, there's a lot of. Uh, I mean, you could that, that thing will make so much power just by a few simple changes. It'll scare you. So. That's what I don't want to do. I want to go from the box stock, put it on the dyno, get it tuned, put it on the dyno, mm -hmm. yep. and then maybe send it down to you guys. Upgrade the cam. Oh, yeah. You said you were getting about another eighty horse out of that. Yeah, motor. yeah, it's it's it's, it's easy. and same torque. You yes. didn't lose anything. Yeah, no, you didn't, didn't lose any torque. Yeah. So, so, think about this engine. It's relatively new, so parts are starting to you know. There's more and more you know like the, the difference in intake manifolds and cams. The, the easy stuff, right? There, the, but that as as it goes on, this this engine's spectacular. I think it's the best thing Ford's done in a long, long time. So. It's kind of like back to the old days. It's kind of back to the old days. Yeah. When, I, when I when I heard push rod V8, I mean, I said I I, I I'm in. Nope. Okay. You, just, you just stick a carburetor on it, and we'll, we'll be okay. Well, thanks, man. I appreciate you ha having here, and it's been fun. Uh, we're going to talk to Frank in a bit. Yeah. Um, guys, you know, one of the best part of my job is I get to talk to really cool people who have done really great things in the car industry, and Pat's one of them. I hold him in a real high regard. He's one of the most skilled guys around, fun to work with. So Dave Smith, Solid Car Guys, this is a Solid Car Guy. Hi, I'm Dave Lindsay. Thanks for checking out this episode of Solid Car Guys. This podcast is intended for entertainment and informational purposes only. The opinions shared by the hosts, guests, and participants are their own and do not reflect the views of Factor 5 Racing or any affiliated companies. The content is not professional advice and any reliance on it is at your own risk. Neither Factor 5 Racing, the hosts, nor the guests are responsible for any loss, injury, or damages. Always seek professional advice for vehicle builds, safety, and regulations. Racing and modifications carry inherent risks. On behalf of Factor 5 Racing, build and drive responsibly.